over the past 8 weeks and 20 lectures, we covered the basics and advanced principles of engineering psychology. As I explained in the first session itself, engineering psychology has very less to do with the field of engineering, rather it focuses on how to modify and use principles of psychology to solve engineering related problems. This lecture will review and summarize everything that we have covered in the past 20 lectures. My aim here in this lecture is to quickly go through all the course content in a nutshell and provide to you a summarized version of the course. So, let us begin. The first section that I introduced was on introducing the field of human factors. What I explained there is how human factors is a applied psychological science and it uses principles of psychology and psychological theory to design environments and systems so that there is a non error producing relationship between systems and humans. The intent of the subject matter of engineering psychology is to modify and design presently working systems and new systems in such a way that the error which is produced by the interactions between humans and machines are kept at a minimum and safety is the priority in any of these interactions. We also looked at where this field of engineering psychology starts from and I had explained how experimental psychology with their knowledge of sensations, perceptions, memory, learning and other cognitive processes help in developing theories and system modifications for the benefit of the operator and the system. The aim of engineering psychologists is to design systems which are producing less error and these systems started with a study on military environments. Engineering psychology started with the uh, military environment and uh, nuclear power plants, but as time passed by this subject of engineering psychology became a more mainstream subject and in today's world it is the center of most sciences. Now, human factors then the knowledge of it is applied to designing of everyday equipment tools and environments and by using the knowledge from experimental psychology the limitations and capabilities of humans could be understood. Similarly, the limitations and capabilities of systems could be understood and based on these learnings a better and interactive system operator relationship can be developed. It is believed that with the use of these knowledges a more error free environment and a more safe environment can be developed which could increase not only personal mental health but also higher production rates. A number of disciplines are involved in the study of engineering psychology and human factors and these fields 
span from the field of engineering, civil, mechanical, electrical and other engineering disciplines to the IO psychology which is the industrial and organization psychology. On one hand, we have inputs from the engineering stream which provides us the limitations and capabilities of systems on which humans work. On the other hand, we have inputs from industrial and organization psychology which gives us methods to train people so that they can fit within the scope of these systems. Now, because humans have always been seeking ways to improve functions, the beginning of human factors can be traced back to the beginning of time. Yet, human factors evolved into a profession just after World War II. What I am trying to explain here is how did the history of engineering psychology progress and if we look at a very vast or a more expanded history of engineering psychology is started with the starting of human beings because it is then when they started using equipments and environments and tools for their progress. But a more brief and narrow approach to the history of engineering psychology can be traced back to the beginning of World War II wherein the actual use of engineering psychology can be seen. Now, in the second session, we looked at research methods and so before making adjustments to the environment for making a better operator environment interaction, we should use the scientific method to determine whether the data agrees with the choices. So, what engineering psychologists do is before proposing any kind of modifications in environments, they look at data and they try to see whether data collected from sample studies agree with their modification. Now, because human factors research is conducted to answer real life problems, to achieve this goal, human factor specialists conduct studies, experiments and quasi experiments to investigate the problem. I also explained in the research method session how different types of data collection using experiments and quasi experiments can be used for collecting data and then verifying the modifications that has been done in terms of the data. There are a number of research designs that can be used, but regardless of the type of research conducted for human factor studies, it is important to consider how the sample will be selected and how this will affect the generalizability of the results of population. So, generalizing results and making some kind of blanket predictions in terms of how the design is going to work comes from the fact that how rigorous is the sample selected from the population. The more variability there is in the sample, the higher the chances that the sample represents the population. In very easy words, the more different types of people that we include in our sample study, the higher the chances that the modification of designs that we are doing so that a much enhanced and productive relationship between the machine and the operator can be developed, the higher fit this design would have to the population. Again, it is critical that the researchers who are conducting human research studies for human factor engineering, they act ethically throughout the research process. Now, one important part is not to have biases. If researchers have biases, this could harm the whole process of human engineering and design modifications done by human engineers. So, a lot of effort is done in terms of making research ethical. How do we do it? By making that the collection of data, the 
treatment of patients and analysis and interpretation of data and the writing of final report happen bias free and error free. If there are biases, then this could lead to some kind of prejudiced view of the predictions and these predictions will then not be generalizable and neither will be very helpful. In the third section, we discussed about displays. In this particular section of display, we looked at visual display, olfactory displays and some other kind of displays. Now, in this section of display, we reviewed the design of visual, auditory, tactile and olfactory displays and the participants that guide the selection of the display that is appropriate for a given application. So, in all, we looked at four different displays. We looked at the principles which guide the basis behind designing these displays. And we also looked at how these principles which guide a particular kind of display. For example, the visual display is affected by things like visual acuity, color vision, visual sensitivity. So, these are the principles which define the visual system. Similarly, for the tactile system, it is about how much pressure is applied, how much sensitive the uh, system is. And so, all these principles we reviewed and we saw how these principles can help us guide better displays which are of particular modality. The four modalities again as we discussed in this section are the visual modality, the tactile mod modality and olfactory. The auditory modality is discussed in the next section. We talked about this principles of the visual display. So, de details of the visual abilities include visual equity which is how closely can you know or distinguish two objects which are separated in space, color vision, contrast sensitivity and depth perception as well as the relevance to design and selection of displays appropriate for different applications and populations of operator. So, we looked at various principles of visual as well as tactile and olfactory displays. The unique characteristics of the tactile and olfactory sensory channels, their potential for reducing the demands of the visual and auditory channel and their ability to provide redundant coding of information were also explained within this section of display. So, we not only looked at the visual display, we also looked at how the tactile and olfactory display can provide redundant information so that when added to the visual display, it enhances people's ability to notice the display. The job of a display is to present certain information to operators. What we did in this section is we looked at how this display can be improved so that the operator has a better chance of noticing the display and ac accordingly work so that there can be an error free system. The next section was focused on audition. Given that vision is our dominant sense, we possess remarkable auditory abilities. You often seen that warnings can come not only from the visual system, auditory systems are also good for warning. For example, the alarm clock which wakes you up in the morning, it is a warning. So, the auditory system is also a very effective way of warning or displaying information. Sound represents a rich and complex source of information. However, the auditory channels has been underutilized as a means to present information to users and explore complex set of purposefully. So, what we did in this section is we looked at what is sound composed of and how auditory displays can be used and the auditory channel can be used to present information to users and how we use the, by using the principles of uh, audition, we can make these displays more effective. Also in this section, I described basic auditory and vestibular abilities 
and highlighted examples of novel for example the spatial audio and the innovative for example the sonification uses of this sensory channel to improve human performances further i also reviewed how noise and stimulus properties including the vocabulary set size and the context effect speech and intelligi intelligibility so all in all we looked at both the auditory system and the vestibular system and i described to you how the limitations and capabilities of this systems and the principles which guide these systems can help us in designing better displays and better message uh, producing systems the next section was about how to evaluate once we have a design and the principal method that i described here is called the user centered design so human factor practitioners use a method called the user centered design or the ucd to incorporate user needs into the design of products this involves gathering of key needs of the target end user of a product and a thorough understanding of the task users will do with it user centered design is all about finding those needs which are present for an interaction between a system and a user and then analyzing and understanding the user user centered design is a design principle where user is kept at the center and the system around him is modified in accordance with the system and the user this is the core of this particular section where i explain to you how different methods of evaluation can help us in designing a better user centered system and a user centered design human factor practitioners often find themselves having to justify the early evaluation of product designs to product engineers marketing executives and corporate exec executives while the engineering psychologists can come up with very good user centered design but most of the system designers they don't agree with human factor engineers until and unless they suffer a loss when they suffer a loss they come back to uh, human engineers to find out why the product is not working and there are a lot of examples of this which is evident and is present around you if you look around you will find a, a lot of systems which tend to not work so what human uh, factor engineers do is provide these designs and it becomes sometimes very difficult to convince these people so human centered design how it is effective is been described in this section now the time effort and cost associated with conducting a heuristic evaluation or a user test are typically much less than the time effort and cost of redesigning after a product has been released one reason why people should be taking the help of human engineers or human factor engineers is because the time and the money which they spend in doing a ucd or user centered design is far less than actually trying to come up with solutions when the product has already been in the market this is the main reason why any manufacturer or any system designer should always focus on principles of ucd and employ human engineers to design better systems the next section was on advanced cognitive processes like memory attention and the use of multitasking here we looked at how the principles of memory and attention and multitasking pose as both a disability and a ability on the side of the user now accidents database offer examples of mishaps from tools or environments whose design failed to consider the capabilities and limitations of human users if you look at 
accidents and why they happen and if you look at the review of accidents you will find out that a number of times it is because the, the system designer did not take input from the human engineer who knows about the capabilities and limitations of human systems or human cognitive systems. This section we reviewed the capacity of human operators to attend process and remember important task related information as well as theories that attempt to explain the basis of these abilities. The section was filled with covering up theories and talking about those principles which define these systems or higher cognitive systems of humans. Psychological theories are powerful tools that the human factor specialist can employ when evaluating new designs to identify the potential impact of design features, thereby maximizing the operator's performance and minimizing the likelihood of errors. Within this section, I explain to you how looking at the theories and using these theories in the actual de <coughs> design of a system and interface can help in maximizing profit and minimizing errors. The next section looked at another advanced cognitive system which is called the decision making. Within this session, I explained how the models of decision making were discussed in light of how decision making under real world conditions often differ than the models. We discussed both the normative and uh, the prescriptive methods of decision making. We also looked at biases and how these biases affect our decision making ability. Human decision making is flexible and employ different strategies depending on the task and situational demand. So, all these factors were explained in detail and considered in this session. The decision making process of experts and how they differ from the novice along with how decision aids can happen and improve the quality of human decisions are discussed at length. Within this section, we looked at both how experts as well as novice makes decision and how they differ and what should be learned from them. Our understanding of decision making helps us to determine what and how much information to display, the best format of the display to facilitate understanding and which designs of aids to use to improve the quality of individual's final decision. So, all in all, the section explained what is decision making to start with and then it talked about principles of decision making and how to use decision making and principles of decision making in such a way that the operator turns out to making more fruitful decisions which are maximizing profit and minimizing errors. The next section was about control. It involves the study of human movement which is crucial to understanding how people interact with technology. Many aspects of designs of control and displays can lead to errors and user annoyances because of mistakes in control use and activation. So, this system was all about how control should be designed and what principles of human cognition should be included in the design of controls. The section covered the facts that affect the speed and accuracy of movements along with a decision of theories, a discussion of theories of how movements are controlled. Further, the section also discussed how controls are designed, how their operation should correspond to the system they are controlling and how a control response can affect a system state. So, in detail, the idea of a control, the principles which help us in designing better controls and the principles on which controls work, all this was discussed in this section. The next section was focused on environmental design, where we looked at those environment factors which include temperature, lighting, noise and arrangement of space, which are a key aspect of human factor engineering. Now, experience with the environment, temperature is affected not only by the air temperature, but also by humidity, airflow and clothing. We discussed four or five environmental variables, one of which was the temperature and as I explained how this temperature is not affected by the dry temperature, but also by humidity and airflow and 
clothing. I also explained how the amount of lighting required for an environment depends on the task. Different tasks require different kind of lighting and in this session I explained to you how the amount of light and the type of illumination affects different type of tasks. In some cases additional task lighting is needed when reading or when the task requires visual high equity. This explains how different tasks are performed under different lighting conditions. Now because of the potential for temporary or permanent threshold shifts with exposure to noise individuals are encountered and encouraged to wear ear plugs or ear muffs as a form of hearing protection as sound levels increases. We also discussed noise and we also explained how this noise can be tackled by using both ear plugs and ear muffs because sound in itself is an environmental factor which can reduce production rates. Physical arrangements and design of environments also affect performance. We looked at how the environment around the operator and the interaction the operator has with different machines also affect his performances. That was another thing that we discussed and the way in which the environment and the interaction of the operator in with things within the environment can be done using something called link analysis. What is link analysis? It identifies the best environment layouts by determining which components are frequently used or have high importance. So, link analysis is a way of explaining how operators interact with different objects around him and which equipment or which system should be placed where so that there is minimum hindrance and maximum productivity in this interaction of the operator and the equipment. The last section was focused on human error. After we have completed explaining the principles of human engineering to the capabilities and limitations of humans to higher cognitive process, the last thing left out was to discuss what is an error and this section covered in detail what is human error. Human error is an intentional or unintentional behavior that leads to an outcome that is not desired as it does not meet the system goal. So, it can be both intentional and unintentional. Now, there are a multitude of ways to classify errors such as errors of commission, errors of omission, the error of a slip or a mistake and the skill, knowledge and rule based errors. So, there are different ways of classifying errors and there is a different understanding of each type of error. This was the focus of this section. It is also important to understand the distinction between errors near misses and accidents. So, not all errors can lead to an accident. Sometimes the error just leads to a near miss. It was also defined in this section what is the difference between these three things. While an error is an unwanted action or a behavior, a near miss are errors that have a potential of becoming an accident. An accident on the other hand is a negative consequence of an action which could lead to loss of life and property. So, in detail we define how these three terms differs from each other and it is not necessary that if you have an error it will always lead to an accident. Sometimes errors do not lead to an accident. So, we looked at these classifications in this section. The determinants of error can occur at the individual or the system level. We described how errors can happen both at the level of the individual and at the level of the system and some examples of errors that can happen at the system and the individual level are further given. Individuals are individuals and system level determinants are the level of expertise, sleep deprivation and stress which are individual factors and communication, leadership and coordination of actions which are system level factors. So, both individual factors and system level factors they interact to produce errors. It is not necessary that it is always the individual factors which will lead to error. Sometimes the individuals are perfect fit 
but because of certain red tapeism or certain kind of policy related issues, the operator cannot perform his job in a right manner leading to frustrations and leading to loss of performances. So, in this section, I explained to you how both system related errors and individual related errors are different from each other and how they interact together to form the whole error component in human engineering. Further, I also described to you how these errors can be minimized or tackled and the ways are training which can increase individual's level of expertise which reduces errors due to ability and reduce stress by increasing experiences and preparation for high demanding situations. I described to you how training of individuals can lead to them being an expert and making decisions at a quick speed and without error. On the other hand, I also explained how management of stress and other intrinsic factors can lead to the possibility of an error for interaction, error free interaction between the human and the systems leading to higher performances and a better human engineering experience. This is all we did in this particular course and in under different sessions of the human engineering course. Thank you for being with me for all these 8 weeks. Namaskar and goodbye.